history buffs, my name is Nick Hodges and I apologise for a very, very delayed podcast. Uh, I know the channel seems dead at the moment, but I have been ill for the past few weeks, so... But uh, just be... Don't be don't be worried, the show is still continuing on. Uh, I also wish to say that Brian McHale wasn't available to do a podcast with me today. Instead, I got my very good f- friend Tyler Davies. Uh, so m- some of you may remember him when uh, I was doing a few podcasts here and there on spill.com so tyler how you doing mate hey mate good to be here not not too bad M- missed you man i thought you dropped off the face of the earth for a little while i know i know it really felt like i had because uh, you were messaging me early today i'm like oh god i really need to get to get around but i think it's like the 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 cold virus that's just like as soon as uh, Dece- uh, November, December rolls around, like everyone seems to be getting it. You're weak, man. You have a weak immune system. I'm telling you. Well, I, well, no, yeah, I don't go to the gym now as much as I used to. <laughs> so that's why you got like this heightened immune system, mate. You've got to get some vitamin C in you at least. Yeah, yeah. You're weak. Here you are, like to uh, save my ass and to present a very uh, entertaining show. Uh, what's new, man? <laughs> <laughs> what's new? Yeah. What's new? It's, it's, it's the way we roll, huh? Yes, so, but there's something different now. We're not reviewing video games like we used to. Yeah, yeah. Foreign Exchange, those good old days. Spill. Oh, God. For anyone who doesn't know, Foreign Exchange was like my first like amateur podcast series we used to do with Brian uh, back in the Spill community. Uh, but, I mean, it was doing, it did pretty well, you know, considering how long ago it was. Yeah, I mean, yeah. we had we had a decent number of listeners. We had um, we had like four hundred listeners regularly around around that number. It's free, actually, free free eighty five. I think we topped out at which which isn't bad for. for the yeah, time, yeah. Huh? I mean, it was actually like I remember it being the the number one uh, fan podcast or something. Yeah, I mean, we're talking yeah. seven years ago now as well, and obviously oh, podcasting's God. come on a lot in in that time. As you God, know. was it seven years? Yeah, like, seven, what... seven years, mate. Seven years. God, we are really old. <laughs> so yeah. we are. Six, six or seven years, in fact. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, I mean, I know that I was on Spill uh, since 2008, I believe. That was kind of like the time when The Dark Knight sort of came out. It was either that or uh, the Transformers movie first came out. And uh, you, you've been with me a few times to Austin, Texas to uh, meet Corey and the gang. Yeah, we went out there for the... Um... The first, the very first Spillcon, um, as it was. Yeah, it was a good, good time. Met the Rooster Teeth guys out there. There was uh, one of the one of the rappers from Wu Tang Clan. I can't remember which one it was. Rizza or someone. Really? Like that. Yeah. I one, can't. I can't. I remember that. Yeah, one of the guys was there from Wu Tang Clan. Um, we had uh, there was a skateboarder there as well. It wasn't Tony Hawk. Before anyone says, "Oh, Tony Hawk," no, no one, no one that famous. Someone sort of famous if you're into that sort of scene. But uh, yeah, we weren't, so we didn't know who it was. But, yeah, and I remember uh, also. I, I, I don't think you were there, but Angry Joe also turned up. He's, he was like randomly a <laughs> fan of Spill dot com. Although unfortunately, I didn't know who he was at the time. Now, and I'm like, oh shit, maybe I should have swapped numbers with him or something like that. <laughs> yeah, no, he wasn't there for the first one. Definitely. I mean, I, I was there for the very first one in London, um, which was the, the sort of the smaller gathering of Spill members. Oh, that's right, you um, were. Which, which you arranged, which Corey came over for. Um, and then, yeah, the, the first, the very first one, the very first official spill con in Austin, Texas. But I mean, even even, even the first one in London, yeah. we had a few guys, other than Corey, obviously. A few of the fans came over from the US, which was pretty cool. Um, not the first one, I think. I mean, like the first one was like twenty, thirty people turned up, and that was also the first time I sort of met Corey as well. And I brought you over, sort of my like bodyguard, you know, <laughs> just, just like, hey, dude. I don't know. I just realised I'm meeting a whole. B- bunch of strange people from the internet. <laughs> social anxiety, social anxiety. <laughs> and then you turn up, you're like, I don't think you got anything to worry about, Nick. <laughs> you'll be fine. <laughs> There's just a bunch of nerds like you. <laughs> it's like you, I'm sure you'd be cool. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I mean, like, so you, all the podcasts we did were mainly about uh, computer games and, you know, bullshitting like that. Because yeah. you won uh, the loading bar a couple of times. We were. Doing shows like uh, what was what were the games that we reviewed? Uh, I, I I came in um, to cover one day for the loading bar. Unfortunately, I didn't get my own animation, which was quite disappointing. I was, I was hoping for some little bald cartoon guy running around. Um, but no, we did the Rugby World Cup, which would have been two thousand and twelve, I think, um, and the Street Fighter Street Fighter version that came out as well at that time on the PS3. Uh, the, the name escapes me completely. No clue. Um, which which version of Street Fighter it was because lots have come out since then. 
Did you? Did we ever used to do? Uh, did you come on the Let's Have It podcasts as well? Unfortunately, not. No. You, not, not once in the whole seven years that we were no, <laughs> doing just, film parties just, and stuff. Just foreign exchange, and um, you did invite me to one. You did one a special edition the day after one of the London spill parties, where Corey Coleman was on BMT. If you remember that that oh, night, he's, arrived. He's always on BMT. Well, yeah, he arrived four <laughs> hours late. Um, right. To the to the party, uh, but yeah, the next day. But I was just completely wrecked, as you know. So I had to, I went home and went to bed. No, no, I understand that. We were all pretty wrecked. But uh, you know what, though? There was one time where t- uh, Corey arrived um, on time. Not on black man time, but like real time. And he comes up to me. And he's like, oh, Nick, I'm so sorry. I'm late again. I'm like, no, you're not. He's like, what are you talking about? It's like, I told you the power, uh, the, the party was going to be late on purpose to see if he would arrive on time. He's like, you son of a bitch, man. That is racist. But, you know, well done for doing that. It worked. <laughs> it worked. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, I, I'm sure that uh, he doesn't work on BMT now. You know, no, so. I'm, I'm sure he doesn't. I'm sure yes. he doesn't. Yeah. But in any case, you're also into history, are you not, Tyler? I'm a bit of a fan of history, yeah. my uh, One of my handles is Cicero. Um, as, as many of you know, the, the Roman senator, ornator, um, read, read to Republic uh, a few years ago. Bit of a fan, I should say. Uh, one of my favourite films of all time. I mean, you, you've, you've reviewed it already as a gladiator, one of the first ones I wanted you to review. And, um, well, you've covered some of my favourites as well. Well, I should do Kingdom of Heaven. You got that one in pretty early as well. Uh, still waiting for that Alexander review, man. Because I'm really, really looking forward to what you have to say about that. Yeah, yeah, I know everyone is. I mean, I, I try to bounce around between different time periods and just, like, give it, like, a sort of variety. I mean, at the moment, I'm, uh, I've just, I finished writing the script for Amadeus. Ah, the original rock and roll bad boy. Yeah, 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 yeah. the original punk rock star, so... Uh, that's in the pipeline at the moment. Uh, I think the second part just needs to be edited, and hopefully that should be out sometime uh, next week. Well, it's about bloody time, man. You're leaving us all hanging, waiting for new content. I mean, I know, I know, no. Like what, once, once I got sick, like, I was just out for the count. Like I was in bed, but uh, but also it's like a really hard uh, movie to re- uh, research because uh, I'm not that. Uh, I don't know that much about classical music in general. I know what I like. I like Mozart and I like uh, Beethoven and uh, Sch- uh, Schubert and all of that. So, but anyway, today we are going to be answering questions from the fans from the last podcast. And I remind everyone out there, um, please send us your questions. So like uh, uh, at the comment section of this video, just post as many questions as you want. We'll try to get through as many as we can on the very next podcast. So, uh, but before then, I just need to uh, answer some general questions that I get again and again and again, uh, <laughs> which has nothing to do with the show so far. For example, uh, everyone keeps asking, what is the name of the song I use in my intro? Uh, well, the song is called Escala. It was covered... Uh, no, sorry, the, the song is called Palladio, and it was covered by a band called Escala, and my sister is the cellist uh, in that band, or was the cellist. If you go to YouTube, guys, and type in Escala, you'll see them on Britain's Got Talent from about six years ago. That's right, yeah. <laughs> and they, they play that song at Britain's Got Talent. Yeah, yeah. I never never watched Britain's Got Talent before, but Nick forced me to watch that one and the following episode where he was he was on it when they meet the family because his sister's group got to the Scala, should I say, they got to the final. Wait, you watched that? I made You made really? me watch that, yeah. Oh no. Oh that's quite embarrassing now. Sending me messages. <laughs> Did you see me? Did you see me on T V? And I was like, Yes, Nick. Well yes, done. Nick, yes, yeah, Nick. for the whole like two seconds that you were on telly, that was like my uh, was 1.5 seconds of fame you know <laughs> on television so <laughs> yeah but, but 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 like uh so that's the name of the song that i use in my intro but also uh it's in the the credits of every video that i put up so like what do you if you ever want to know what's the name of the song or what's the name of a, a film that i show in the review like apart from the main movie itself the clips are always provided in the the credits you can't ask people to read man that's what I do. Every time I watch a movie, I'm like, that's a really cool song. I want to check it out. And then I wait until I get to the credits. If people could do it for uh, the Marvel movies, you know, <laughs> they want to see the uh, the end credit sequence, then they could do the they could do the same. So uh, so if you ever see anyone in the comment section asking what's the name of the song, just uh, say to them, it's either Palladio by Escala, or you could check out the credits and see what's there. Uh, another question I get is, uh, will I be tackling... 
uh, non-Hollywood or British historical movies, you know, like, like Chinese, Japanese, uh, etc. And the answer is yes, I am uh, doing Hollywood and British movies for the moment because, you know, the channel's just starting out and I want to, uh, you know, just get a big enough audience before I start tackling some uh, Korean cinema, for example. I mean, like, there's some fantastic... Uh, movies about like the Korean War that I would love to touch over, or the, the Ch- about the Chinese Empire. I want to do uh, Mongol at some point, you know, movie about Genghis Khan and all of that. Uh, but I mean, just for the now, uh, I'm keeping it with like English language movies for the moment. So, all right, so on to our main questions, Tyler. Are you ready? I'm ready to rumble. So, Nick, tell us what <laughs> is your opinion on. And you may remember these as books from your childhood, okay, mm-hmm. from being at school, because I, I certainly do. I actually wasn't aware that they turned this into a TV series until the question came in. But what's your opinion on uh, CBBC's Horrible Histories? I have no opinion on it. I've never, I didn't even know it existed. Like, it's like I thought, from what I remember, it was like a, it was like a book series. Yeah, That's they, they were it, book series. Yeah, series. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was like a. In, I read them in the school library, and I remember it being very sort of cheeky, dirty, you know, like the stuff that you wouldn't normally read in a history book of like really dark stuff of like what Henry the Eighth was like, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I mean, like if it's, I mean, I guess it was a children's series, but I wouldn't mind seeing like a an adult version of uh, horrible histories, you know. <laughs> I mean, maybe this is what uh, history buffs could stand in for, like you know, just like to show up the like truly messed up stuff. Well, but uh, apparently, it's been going since um, 2009, and it's still going now. It's uh, sketch comedy for kids. Do you think that's uh, an adequate way to teach children history? Do you think that's a good good way moving forward to get kids interested in history? Or absolutely, yeah. I, I, I like that was the biggest the biggest issue I had in school was how my teachers taught history. They got bogged down on very innate details, like about uh, dates or the what the person was doing, that, but rather than the angle of the story, yeah. of how to make it compelling. Mm-hmm. I mean, what's more I- interesting, like uh, t- talking about the, the reason why Julius Caesar wanted to reform the political structure of the, the Republic, or the exact method of how he was doing it? Uh, I mean, they... Um... They base them apparently. They're based on uh, like British history classics like Blackadder and Monty Python. So it's a sort of more of a satirical take on history um, than to what you would have seen generally from other documentaries or history shows. I think that's quite a good idea moving forward. I mean, if anyone who hasn't seen the Monty Python films, if you're into sort of a silly British slapstick sort of comedy, I suggest you go and check them out. I assume the majority of people would have done as well. Blackadder as well. Rowan Atkinson. A lot of you may know him from Mr. Bean. Uh, Stephen Fry from QI as well. He's in Blackadder as well as Hugh Laurie. For you Americans, Dr. House, in fact. So if you want to see some of the stuff from these guys' earlier careers, go and check out Blackadder, certainly. Um, I mean, that's quite funny. I always think of Hugh Laurie from Blackadder. I don't think of him in House. So I, like, when... <laughs> I'm sure a lot of people will be surprised to see that side of Hugh Laurie. Uh, a lot of people, a lot of American listeners that or viewers that we have on, uh, that you have, sorry, on, on History Buffs would have only know, would probably only know who, Hugh Laurie from... Uh, as Dr. House. Well, I mean, I know some friends of mine, like, uh, th- there's this one girl who thinks that Hugh Laurie is really hot. And I'm really? Like, ex- and I'm like, excuse me? And she's like, oh, she's he's so hot in the uh, in, uh, house. Uh, like, I love his American accent. I'm like, you do realize the guy's British? I'm like, no, no, he's not. And then I show him, like, a, show a, a sketch from Black Adder where he's, like, really all poncy. And, 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 like, the attraction immediately wore off. Like, the moment he doesn't have an American accent, you know, he's not attractive whatsoever. Oh, dear. <laughs> Is this an American friend or a British friend? American friend. So. Oh, I would have thought the, the fact that he was English and having an English accent would have made him all the more appealing. Apparently, we're yeah. quite exotic. Yeah, but he's so not, like... Told. Yeah, but he's not like Daniel Craig British, you know. He is, uh, you know, whimsical sort of British, you know, not least attractive whatsoever British. Uh, I mean, at least the way he is in Blackadder, so <laughs> I just think he's a very good actor. Yeah, so. I can see that to a certain degree. I mean, I, I don't know if you remember on the point of the British accent. Do you remember when we were in Austin, Texas the first time, someone came up to me and said, hey, that's a really cool accent. Where are you from? I said, England. New England? No. <laughs> no. England. Where's that? It was like 
This is um, like Tyler, Tyler, just just like let it slide because it's going to happen to you another thousand times. You know? Yeah, it did. It's <laughs> like, hey, hey, man, you got a really cool accent. Are you from Northern Texas? Yeah, eventually you realized how uh, how it help you with the girls. Then you're like, ah, okay, now I can use my uh, my powers for evil. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty cool. I mean, you know, the accent isn't really appealing over here because everyone in the south southeast of England talks like this, don't they? So, so. so Nick, tell me, what's your favorite era of history and and why? Of course, my favorite era in history. Um, it's, and it's probably going to sound boring, but I, I I love the the Roman Empire. Oh, who doesn't? No, I mean, yeah, it's it's just like. Uh, something so far removed from the way we kind of see things now it, it's like more epic on a grander scale with the buildings they made the 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 the, the battles uh, like just so grand I, I just love it so much and the characters in it are just brilliant but like everything up to like the uh, the beginning to the fall of the roman empire so you got like julius caesar but you also got like attila the hun mm. i mean even even right from the beginning of the roman empire when they were just a small, a small town, small city state, uh, growing up fighting against the Etruscans and uh, betraying the Etruscans. In fact, in fact, I'm sure you, I'm sure you know the story, um, how they invited the uh, the neighbouring Etruscans to a mill. Uh, lots of men and women. I can't remember the exact numbers. It's been a while since I've read the story. And uh, in the night, they murdered the men and kept the women for themselves to grow the empire. Uh, what about um, when they became like a first like superpower? It was when they were against Carthage. The 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 the, the wars they had against them were like uh, just how, how like first how they developed the navy, but then also like uh, well they how... reverse they reverse engineered a Carthaginian ship, didn't they? Yeah, uh, there's, yeah. There's a Carthaginian ship that run aground, and uh, they basically deconstructed it completely because they didn't have a navy prior to this time, um, and they just reverse engineered it. In fact. And then they built their own fleet to go up against the go uh, go up against Carthage and managed to successfully invade. Uh, yeah, but but also like in the Second War when uh, Hannibal the Second uh, Punic War the Second Punic War where when Hannibal uh, got into Spain and then he got his army of elephants and uh, warriors and all of that and got through over the Alps. Like, have you ever been to the Alps? No, I haven't. No, it's. Like I, I went skiing one time. And I'm just looking at these mountains, thinking, "How the fuck did he get elephants to go over this thing?" They There's... used um, took vats of vinegar, didn't they, and salt to to break down the rock in the Alps to carve a path through. Well, yeah, I, they. I think it was either it was vinegar and wine as well. They like poured it over the rocks, and they had like a fire going on underneath it, and then the rocks would sort of crack, mm. and then they would sort of pull them down with the elephants. But it, it's just. Like un- unbelievable uh, feat, <laughs> like I-, I can't imagine like how it would just translate today, <laughs> you know, without like machines and all of that. So, uh, I-, I yeah, I would say that the the Roman era would be maybe my favorite era in history. Have you seen the um, the TV show Rome that used to be on BBC, or were you a fa- were you a fan of that? I love that show. Uh, I think I was. I was a bit wary of it first because I knew that it had been cancelled on the second season, um, but I decided to give it another chance and watch it all through again. But I was quite happy with the way it, it concluded. Like I hate it in uh, television series when they know they're about to get cancelled, and rather than uh, leaving it all on the cliffhanger, these guys actually took the time to conclude the whole story properly enough so it sort of made sense. What What about Spartacus? Have you ever seen the Spartacus TV show? Oh, you had to bring that up. Yeah, yeah. I haven't watched Spartacus yet. Okay, like get you, to it, man. Uh, you and everyone else in the show has been on my case to bloody watch Spartacus. Yeah, I, I will. I swear to God, I will. I mean, like, just been. Uh, I've got other things that I need to to finish beforehand. But uh, yeah, at some point, I will have to not only watch Spartacus, but more than likely, I'll have to review it. So, because the only Spartacus movie I've seen is the the Stanley Kubrick movie. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the first season is is called Gods of the Arena. It's a mini series which is basically focused on one house. Um, it's the house of Batiatus, in based in the city of Capua, um, and uh, like the the one of the main protagonists is Quintus Batiatus, who's the head of the house effectively, um, and it, the story revolves around that. But don't be surprised that the actor will change. The main actor who plays Spartacus will change. Um, for the third season, unfortunately, he dies of cancer, um, which is a really big surprise, actually, because he's a guy in great physical shape and condition. 
I was about uh, to ask: Is it like vis- uh, is is it visible? No, like... not not in the slightest. You you you'd be you'd be completely surprised. I actually picked it up. Um, it's Andy Whitfield was his name, um, and he was replaced by Liam McIntyre. I actually started watching it from the third season. So when Liam McIntyre came in, um, I hadn't seen it prior to that. So he was the first Spartacus that um, I encountered actor-wise. I prefer him. People generally disagree with me who started watching from the start. They said it wasn't the same, but you know that's obviously reasons for that. Obviously because they started watching it with the original actor. Um, but yeah, you know it's a, it's a very good show. There's there's four seasons. Um, you've got Gods of the Arena, Blood and Sand, Vengeance, and Raw of the Damned. Does it conclude Spartacus' story, or do they it get does? Canned? It does. Okay. Yeah. It does. It, it basically shows the rise of Spartacus and the rise of the slave army and the rebellion against the Roman Empire. It's very, it's very gory. Um, some of the scenes are, f- some of the scenes are filmed very three hundred esque, you know, with sl- slow motion decapitations and uh, limbs coming flying off and things like that. But it's not too, uh, too much in the same same style as as, uh, as three hundred. That was the thing. I was probably uh, made me a bit wary about watching the show because I love three hundred, but. Uh... Sticking with that for an entire TV show, you know, it's just uh, because I don't like uh, when they film everything against a green screen. Mm. And I think when 300 came out, it was sort of revolutionary. But I don't know about you, but I think most of us are getting kind of sick of it. Yeah. So, <laughs> when people just you know, rely on the green screen all the time. I'm much more uh, into practical effects and shooting on real locations. But I mean, if if everyone, if you say it's like really good, then I'll definitely need to check it out. So I mean, with you, you like that about Game of Thrones as well. I mean, obviously, Game of Thrones isn't historical, in essence, historical TV show. Although there is elements that are steeped in history. But do you prefer that, like King's Landing being filmed in Dubrovnik, um, and then just adding layers to the city rather than it just being completely green screen? Yeah, yeah, no, I really do because, like, uh, like there was one. Uh, I think in the last season of Game of Thrones, they are in. Um... Dawn. They're in Dawn. Yeah, Cordoba, I believe they filmed in in Spain. Cordoba. Ex- exactly, and you could see that uh, the 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 Islamic uh, the the Moorish architecture mm. and just the building themselves the buildings themselves tell a story, and you get a sense of how old it is, and you get a sense of how old this world is in Game of Thrones. So every piece of architecture you see in the show, all the landscape, just tells a bigger story and uh, that's not being told on the screen you know by the actors or whatever so that I mean, th- that's i really really love so in in terms of well, just on the get while we're on game of thrones have you seen the promotional uh, poster for the new season yeah 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 they got a uh, john snow i knew it i knew he's not dead well well that you can't see his eyes well don't, i don't need to see his eyes but what could that possibly imply well, I don't know. I mean, like maybe he might be blind or something, but uh... a, a walk, maybe, a th- or uh, a white, p- possibly. I mean, I know he isn't he. Uh, there's a theory that he's meant to be a Zora High or something. Yeah, that is one of the the fan theories going around. Yeah, yeah. So I'd be interested in seeing that. I mean, I, I love how they've given up on trying to like uh, pretend that he's not coming back at all with all these uh, leaked photos of him on set or him in uh, Belfast Airport. You know, coming to the set. So, <laughs> well, I mean, it's, it's unfortunate. A lot of people in um, in Ireland, where they're filming in Northern Ireland near Giants Causeway, they were um, flying personal drones over and recording the <laughs> recording the filming. So they had, yeah, so they had literally people's personal drones are flying over and recording them while they were filming, and they could see Jon Snow basically wearing the Stark colours as opposed to uh, the colours of the Night's Watch. Um, on set, so it sort of gave an implication that, well, either it's a flashback or it's part of the forthcoming uh, season. God, I would really love to see if uh, if there are any outtakes of, like, you know, hundreds of little drones, like, flying above the set. <laughs> He's like, God, you guys, please move. Okay, you will allow you to leak the photo. We just need to shoot yeah. this episode for the day. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I've got to say congratulations as well, by the way. Your Game of Thrones video gained 17,800 views. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, that that's, uh, uh, that's quite surprising. <laughs> yeah, it's my highest rated video. Although, I'll be honest with you, I, I sometimes view... Uh, I get really nervous whenever I see a comment on my Game of Thrones uh, video because most of the people who, who comment on it are diehard fans of the show. So any little tiny, tiny mistake I may have made whilst doing the video, they defend it to the to the death, and they get so offended. Uh, whereas 
I, I, I thought like I was just explaining to people like how much I love this show and this historical stuff that I see. These are my interpretations, but um, I don't know. It, I think uh, it's because they follow the show so much. Whereas these films that I'm reviewing most of the time, they uh, they are in it for the long haul. They actually like it for the content that uh, History Buffs is producing. Mm-hmm. So yeah. But uh, also another thing I forgot to mention is like we got three thousand subscri- uh, subscribers as of this episode. That's great, that's fantastic. Moving forward, you've had the channel up for a very short space of time. It's been like well. Nearly four months. That's a massive achievement. Yeah, <laughs> I'm really excited to see how it goes in a year's time. I'm crossing my fingers, but hopefully, we're really good. So, uh, to anyone listening, I'm, I'm, thank you so much for supporting me for this long. I had one guy who was saying, like, uh, Nick, I've been watching your video since you had like 50 subscribers. <laughs> I'm like, Jesus Christ! Like, thank you so much because I'm still figuring out what kind of uh, show this is. So, uh, thank you all for your your patience with this. <laughs> and uh, just to put this question to bed because you get asked this quite a lot. I've noticed in the Game of Thrones video, mm-hmm. are you planning on doing a part two which will cover um, the the, the War of the Roses, for example. Oh, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, yeah, everyone asks me or complains in the Game of Thrones video, like, why didn't I cover War of the Roses? Why didn't mention War of the Roses? War of the Roses, Tyler, is an unbelievably complicated thing to talk about. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, and uh, I didn't think it. I think if I was ever to mention War of the Roses, it deserves its own video. Like, it, it shouldn't be mentioned in a. Uh, like a, in a sentence it needs to be fully spoken about and analyzed and mm-hmm. uh, have direct comparisons between the Lannisters and the Starks and all of the rest of it but also like my knowledge of the War of the Roses is very limited I know enough to know to see the uh, comparisons between the the War of the Five Kings in Game of Thrones to uh, the War of the Roses but uh, yeah I, I would need to dedicate like a whole episode just to doing that. Okay, and yeah. uh, have you heard of the book The Iron King by Maurice Duron? Yes, you told me about it. Yeah, um, <laughs> if, if anyone isn't aware of this book, this is supposedly one of the books that influenced George R. R. Martin. Uh, it, again, it's The Iron King by Ma- Maurice Duron. I may have butchered the name, but he's French, so I do apologise for any, uh, any French out there. Um, it was written in the mid 1950s and it, uh, released, it was, received an update recently. It's a seven volume saga chronicling uh, the dynasty fight for the French throne in the early part of the 14th century, which basically culminated around the Hundred Years' War with France. Um, so that will give you, that that will show you a lot of the inspiration that George R.R. R. Martin received as well when writing Game of Thrones. Uh, as well as, obviously, War of the Roses and what Nick discussed in the uh, in the History Bus video. Yeah, um, but there aren't many English translations of the book. No, there are. There is, there, is, uh, there is an English translation. Isn't it? No, there are series, though, aren't they? Like, isn't that yeah, one of the series different... of seven volumes? Right. Okay. Okay. Uh, I, I guess now that uh, you know Master Grimm has uh, given his thumbs up, I think people have been demanding that they <laughs> get like more of them in in English. I remember an article saying about it somewhere that uh, it's been because they've been around for a while. That's mm-hmm. mostly always been in French. These books. So we'll. Uh, I'll, I'll send Nick a link, and we'll get that posted for you in the. Uh the description of the video and you can go check that out all right brilliant if you guys if you guys are interested in that uh, so um just to backtrack slightly onto the roman empire one question i wanted to ask you which slipped my mind completely at the who would win in uh, a field battle do you think in your opinion between the roman empire at the height of its power okay and the huns oh uh, god that's good um uh, to be honest, I think the Huns. I mean, like, I think they would have a harder fight in their hands. But the Huns, uh, they they didn't follow the same rules of combat that the Romans did. I mean, like, if you just look at um, how at the height of Rome's power, like how many how many legions were destroyed in the Battle of Teutoburg Forest mm-hmm. by the barbarians? They, they on in the open field, they will kick ass. But the Huns, they didn't fight like that. They fought like. Uh, the Mongols, I mean, there's some of the theories out there that they may have been descended, uh, the Mongols may be descended from the Huns, that for, may, they actually might be from Mongolia, and they tended to fight on horseback with um, bows and arrows and uh, dragging, like, ropes with logs and stuff like that, and uh, and actually, when the uh, the Huns first came into Europe, 
uh, they were the ones who were terribly outnumbered by the Eastern Romans and the Western Romans, and uh, they want they did the most damage. It was only when they got all the barbarian tribes they could to defeat. That's what it took to defeat the Huns. So shock cavalry wasn't it really from the uh, the Huns? Shock cavalry and cavalry archers, which obviously wouldn't have been much. Uh, well, obviously the Roman the Roman foot soldiers would obviously wouldn't have been much against them. Unless they wanted to move in um, in formation across the line, but then they would have caught the Huns. They have to sit in sestudo form and wait for the Huns to run out of ammunition from the arrows before they can advance. I mean, it's like an early form of blitzkrieg, you know? <laughs> like that's why they're able to move everything all in one go. They just terrorize the, the the landscape, kind of how the Mongols were able to conquer such a vast empire. Mm. So yeah, I, I, I give it to the Huns each well, time. They'd raise cities in their wake as well, so there's never any danger of the uh, the army re- returning to the city and refortifying. Exactly, that's how I play in Attila Total War. So <laughs> that's why I always choose the Huns. Yeah, we we need to do a uh, a joint campaign one day. Yeah, that'd be sweet. We'll and maybe we could post it up on the site. We'll go against each other, and yeah, we can stick <laughs> yeah. that up as you say. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, well, prove me wrong. Prove me wrong, Tyler. You know, okay, we'll, you we'll, pick the Romans at the height of their power, and I'll pick the Huns. So. We'll give it a go. I'll rebuild the Roman Empire, and I'll crush you. <laughs> That'd be sweet. So, tell me, what is your favourite historical TV show? Oh, that should be easy. Uh, Vikings. I mean, actually, who's who's this question by? Uh, did I? Oh, sorry, sorry. This is by uh, Aris, I believe his name is. Hmm. Uh, yeah, uh, my favourite historical TV show is Vikings. Have you ever seen it? Uh, I haven't yet. No, to be completely honest, I've um, I've been fully engrossed in the new season of Heroes and uh, Agents of Shield. Oh God! All right. Well, you can't give me shit for not watching Spartacus, and then you haven't seen Vikings. Okay, I mean, like this is like hardcore historical uh, television making here. I think it's to me. I feel it's better than Rome. That's how good it is. And uh, the last season that uh, watched, I thought was absolutely one of the best TV uh, seasons of all time where the Vikings attack um, Paris. And, uh, but what I love about it is how authentic that show is to what Vikings were, were really like, rather than being them this goofy bad guys with the horned helmets. Like it just shows how, um, how advanced they were with the sh- uh, ship building, but also their religion. It's like, it's like a good uh, show to watch whilst you're waiting for Game of Thrones. Mm-hmm. So yeah. Mm-hmm. So if you if you like Game of if you love Game of Thrones, you like Vikings. I guarantee you. That's, uh, I've been yeah. meaning to check it out. Uh, I've also been meaning to check out The Last Kingdom as well, which is a new show on BBC. Have you seen any of that at all? Uh, is isn't that a time travel movie or something? No, 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 no. It, it's set in the year eight seventy two. No, I haven't seen it. Wait, is uh, is it about Vikings as well? Uh, basically, it's set in England. Yeah, and there's many separate kingdoms in in England as it was at the time, um, and a lot of them have fallen to the invading Danes. Um, so there's the last great kingdom of Wessex standing alone and defiant under Athelred. If you Alfred, Athelred. yeah, yeah, Athelred. Um, but, uh, basically, and the main hero, his name's Uthred. He's uh, born the son of a Saxon nobleman, um, and he's got Danish ancestry. His his bloodline is Danish, from what I can remember, and he is basically forced to choose between his country of birth and the people of his upbringing. So he was born in Denmark. He is a Dane, but he was born in England. Um, and his loyalties are basically tested to decide whether he's a Saxon or a Dane and who he's going to fight for. This this actually might be a good companion to watch with Vikings because Vikings uh, takes place before uh, Last Kingdom. Like, uh, in, in in the last season of Vikings, Alfred is born. So you see him as a baby. But, like, so in this show, you get to see him as the king, the legendary king who uh, pretty much, what, kicked the Vikings' ass. Yeah. So. But like the, the the show Vikings follows a character called Ragnar Lothbrok, who is uh, probably the most famous Viking of all, and uh, a lot of the thing is he's kind of like the the King Arthur of Norse uh, mythology. Mm-hmm. It's it's hard to figure out where the real man is and where the um, the myth uh, sort of uh, ends, and. Uh, you see a, a lot of famous Vikings uh, that we uh, know, like uh, Bjorn Ironside, um, I got the, the the Boneless, where they all said that they were his her, his sons. So, and you see them uh, in the show. So, yeah, uh, there we go. Like, so favorite historical TV show is Vikings. Excellent. Well, Last Kingdom is definitely something we both need to check out. I mean, on on 
Rotten Tomatoes, they give it 92% uh, approval rating. And IMDb, uh, the fans give it 8.5 out of 10 from, from 5,500 votes. Is it based on uh, Bernard Cornwell's books? Um, the the um, guy who wrote Sharp and um, the... Yes, it is. Oh, awesome. It's, ba- it's based on the, the series, the Saxon stories. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I've read the books. I can't remember anything uh, about the plot line, but i got to watch. I'm, I'm a big Sharp fan, basically. Well, it, it debuted on BBC Two in the UK on the 22nd of October, 2015. And uh, for those of you guys listening from America, it's on BBC America since the 10th of October, 2015. So it's still a relatively new show. There's only seven episodes out. So you guys can binge watch and, and catch up. David Dawson's actually the actor that plays King Alfred. If you're uh, familiar with David Dawson at all. Uh, no, I'm not. No. I should hope not anyway, because um, he was originally in Coronation Street at one point. That's why I don't know who he is. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I don't, don't watch Coronation Street. No, dude. me neither. So I, yeah. I, was, I was hoping your answer would be no <laughs> to that. But he's also been in Lufa as well as, uh, as, well as comedians and posh. So... Um, on on that point, actually, speaking about King Alfred and so forth, who's your favourite historical figure? That, oh god. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure if I have I really have an answer for that, to be honest. Because, <laughs> like, uh, it, it sort of fluctuates all the time. So like, not, I, not, not Balin, no? Uh, actually, no, Balian is a, a really fascinating character. The real Balian, not the one that they show in the Kingdom of Heaven. Like, I, I don't know why they got Orlando Bloom to play him. He's just like the most uninteresting actor for that sort of role. I know he's a, he's a great guy, and uh, he he really d- plays an elf really well. But I don't picture him playing like a Balian of Evelyn. I mean, uh, from what I've heard, Orlando Bloom is a great guy, absolutely. But he really is the same in almost every role he's casting, don't you think? I mean, from from Pirates of the Caribbean to Lord of the Rings to to uh, Kingdom of Heaven, he's he's basically the same character in each. I think he's limited with his range to a degree. Considering he's limited for his range, he's a lot more successful than I am or ever will be. You know, don't get me wrong, guys. I'm <laughs> not saying I'm a better actor than uh, than Orlando Bloom before anyone jumps in the comments section and says, well, I can fucking see you do better, dick. Um, but, it, uh, it's nice to see some hate wash on you for once because I get yeah. a lot of crap for Kingdom of Heaven, man. Uh, I mean, but a lot of people loved that film. I didn't know people loved it that much. I just, I can't stand it. I, I loved the film, personally. I, I said this to you as well. It's one of my favourite films. And you were like, really? Come on. Yeah. It, it's, it's, it's so bad. It's so wrong, completely. But no, uh, you know, anything to do with the, the, the Crusades and the medieval, medieval period, I, I really enjoy. I love that stuff, dude. The Crusades is one of my favourite uh, historical time periods. It's just that... Um, his his acting, like you know, when he's giving the the speech to fight against the the Muslims coming Arise into the game. Night. No, not that bit. He's like huh. saying, "Come on, come on." That's like really. That's the lamest speech I've ever given. I that would not rouse me to put my life in harm's way for this dickhead. You know, <laughs> I would need- be I would be moving to the back of the line. You know, I'd let someone else die before of me. <laughs> it wouldn't so, even arouse me to get out of bed, let alone get in, go into battle. Yeah, it's no William Wallace speech. I'll say that for sure. You know, it's no uh, Aragon in uh, Return of the King. You know, it's just like, come on, come on. You know, it's. I I thought that Tyrion's speech in uh, Game of Thrones when uh, the Battle of Blackwater Bay. I thought that was more arousing, and he was taking the piss in that speech. <laughs> Speaking of William Wallace, when are you going to do Braveheart? I'm actually uh, researching for Braveheart right now. A- any ETA on that for the fans out there? Uh, what well, time of arrival? Uh, well, I don't know. I haven't even started writing it yet. I'm watching the movie and I'm trying to research as much as I can. It's really hard because William Wallace seems to be like the the Scottish version of Robin Hood. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, like even his uh, his uh, wife or supposed wife, we're not really sure, is named Marion, the real one. In the movie, her name is Morin or something like that. And, you know, Robin Hood also had Maid Marian. So I'm like, I'm, so I'm kind of skeptical of how much of the uh, the romantic plot line in the movie is true. So... Not a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but, so can, can you not think of any one really prominent figure from history that sort of stands out in your mind as sort of one you hold above the rest? Uh... Pff. Uh, no, no, my mom. What about you? Maybe you could save me. <laughs> like maybe you can recommend someone. Um, well, you know, I, I used I used to read quite a lot of philosophy uh, a few years ago, as you know, when I was in my last year at uni. And mm-hmm. uh, yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, uh, the, the Republic by Plato. 
um, certainly something that, that stood out in my mind. Um, I, I enjoyed that wholeheartedly. Um, some of the, the stuff by Socrates um, certainly is even true to, to this day, so I'd say probably one of the historical philosophers more than more than anyone else um, sort of stands out in my mind. Uh, but if we're talking from uh, historical contents in terms of movies, uh, then the the one that you know sort of gives me chills down my spine and uh, you sort of can learn a lot from would probably be Leonidas. Why is that? Why Leonidas? Uh, just I think is you know great. He embodies Spartan values and for the time period, um, and is sort of sort of definitely the sort of part that, I mean that Gerald Butler portrays the character very well. I think, um, but from a historical standpoint as well, and and uh, the, what's written from that time period he's certainly a king that you definitely want to follow into battle and give your life for yeah I, I agree with you on that part he was one of the few spartans who actually really committed to the spartan way of life because you know the the, the spartans were defeated in yeah. battle and they did surrender you know when they were during the was it the peloponnesian war mm-hmm. which was unheard of those like the myth- they built up the myth that uh, spartans never surrender they they die in battle and all of that uh, like so he fully committed knowing that he was going to die in fact that's why he got 300 spartans to fight the persians in the first place because they needed um the spartans needed a kick up the arse away from their religious festivals to kind of get themselves in gear and a death of a king was definitely going to sort of ignite that so yeah i i see what you mean there back to the question i'm going to press you here for an answer if you had to choose someone gun to the head who who's the who's your favorite historical figure um Come on, this is a question okay, people a fa- have been okay, asking. Okay, favorite. Okay, okay. What? What am I? Gun most... to the head. Fine. Right, gun to the head. I'd say Julius Caesar. Okay. Because that's a guy who uh, just kind of just went for it. Like uh, he went against the sort of status quo and he built an empire out of nothing. And uh, at the at the time, uh, I feel like the the republic was very corrupt, and um, people were kind of getting sick of all these uh, politicians you know, scheming and bullshitting and all of that. That was uh, really interesting for me, but I don't uh, condone what he did to the Gauls. You know, he did like wipe out, exterminate a million Gauls in order to him to achieve his objectives. But the fact that he went from Gaul, then went to like Egypt, like he this guy uh, to like to, to Turkey, he he went everywhere. You know, <laughs> on his campaigns, he was like uh, the Alexander of the Roman world. Well, that was the thing that motivated him. Uh, it was said that when he encountered the statue of Alexander the Great, he sort of realised the dissatisfaction with his life um, and realised that when Alexander was his age, he effectively had the world at his feet and Caesar had re- achieved very little in comparison to Alexander. So he, he basically wanted to emulate, try and emulate Alexander as much as he could. About, uh, one of the stories say that he wept when he saw the statue of Alexander because yeah. he, he felt like he was a failure in his life compared to Alexander the Great. Uh, no, I could see that, and it's kind of ironic that he did end up in Alexandria, and that he went to the the, the library and all of that. He could, uh, did there wasn't there like a coffin of Alexander that apparently you could see where he was embalmed or something in the glass? There, yeah, there was. Yeah, yeah, uh, that, that must have been some a sight to see. Although we don't know where that is now. Although archaeologists think they may have found that again recently. Where? Um, I remember. I can't remember exactly. I remember reading the article a few months ago. They uncovered a tomb uh, in Greece. There was a landslide and they uncovered a tomb which was lavishly decorated and the way it was sealed basically implied that it was it for a high-ranking official or a leader, basically. So in the time period of carbon dating from the rocks uh, show it's from around the time where Alexander died. So if it's not the tomb of Alexander, then it's the tomb of one of Alexander's high-ranking generals or a friend of his. That would be pretty sick. I mean, like I got chills down my spine when I was watching a documentary and they found um, King Philip's tomb. Mm. And you could see, like, actual paintings on the walls of Alexander and Philip. And I was just thinking, like, wow, Alexander himself stood in that tomb. Because it's such a long time ago, like, Alexander's almost like a a mythical figure as much as uh, Heracles, you know, or Perseus. But, like, that just kind of reminds you, like, no, he really did exist. And yet they got Colin Farrell to play him in the film. I know, I know. Maybe you can come with me on that review. Because, <laughs> like, you seem more pissed off about that movie than I. I find it just boring, to be honest. It had so much potential, man. I mean, you you got such an iconic character like Alexander the Great, and you pick someone like Colin Farrell to play Alexander. Someone who has 
He's just, he just did not do the character justice. He just did not portray Alexander very well. What I find most funny is that uh, Colin Farrell was unable to do an English accent, so uh, Val Kilmer had to do an Irish accent for for his sake. I was like, oh, God, could you have just picked someone who is capable of acting in the way you wanted <laughs> rather than having the actors adapt their performance according to him? Yeah, I don't, I don't know. It was just such a disappointing film. Uh, it's just... I just, I just I just get having nightmares just thinking about it. I just don't know what they were thinking in any way, shape, or form. It's horrible, horrible, horrible casting choice. All right, <laughs> okay. Uh, <sighs> so, what's the next question? Oh uh, yeah, uh, I've lost the name of who this is from. But are there any historical periods you really like that aren't adequately represented in historical films or documentaries? Um, I th- I think um, I would love to see one about the uh the american revolution but sort of done in a in a non sort of biased way i mean like i i know that john adams is is a contender but um i feel like there was so much more going on than just like what was presented in the um, in the patriot i mean like i fucking loathe that movie but like as yes, we know yeah yeah i really really do but i i want to see like uh the worst of the worst for the british what they did and for the Americans, the American Revolution has been sort of romanticized in uh, in movies and in pop culture. And to kind of get an idea of like how it went down and the hypocrisies that uh, were going on between the British and the Americans, mm-hmm. like that would have been brilliant to see. And, and also the um, the immediate after effects. Like usually in, in movies, you get uh, the Americans get independence and yay, America's born. But I want to see like immediately what happened after. Like uh, George Washington wins this war, and he's his country has enormous debt. So, what's he going to do? Is he going to raise taxes again? But that was what kicked off the war to start off with. Like, what does he do after that? So, I mean, I know I know exactly what he did, but I would like to see like uh, how that sort of um, develops. I mean, maybe into as a as a television show or something. I wouldn't mind seeing like that. Okay. Yeah. Um, I know maybe I I would like to see some TV shows go into the Umayyad Caliphate, mm-hmm. see like how the the Byzantine Empire uh, sort of fell, like because the Umayyad Caliphate was like one of the largest empires in history, and there's not there's very little done about it. Now remind me, the Umayyans were the the Moors effectively that invaded and conquered Spain. Uh, yeah, I mean, like, so the, the Umayyad Caliphate was established, like, in in, um, in Arabia after the the Prophet Muhammad died, and then they conquered, like, the, the, the Middle East and North Africa, they went into Spain, Sicily, they also invaded France, like, I think that would be really interesting. This this was the group, they, they conquered Spain and invaded France, and was this the, uh, the uh, during the time period of Charles Martel, Charles the Hammer, um, mm. they, um... They lost the Battle of Pontiers, which effectively ended the the push of the Arabs into Europe. At the time, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, the, then they kind of focused their efforts on the on the Byzantines, but like the, they were essentially like the sort of new Roman Empire. And uh, after the fall of the Roman Empire, like Europe was, it must have been sort of like the apocalypse going on. Like every time we see uh, how. In, in The Walking Dead and like society sort of crumbles and then you got like this uh, new enemy on the rise and they suddenly the uh, the Umayyads were way more technologically advanced and everything than everyone else was so uh, that's what I would like to see to correct myself sorry it was a battle of tours not a battle of Pontiers before someone jumps in okay the comment section <laughs> so uh, maybe, maybe too get, late <laughs> down, down my throat yeah someone's already commented it's a battle of tours you, you D- noob you dickhead you yeah. penis well, what about um, you? What, what what do you think? Uh, historical period. I, I would like a film about the Battle of Tours, in fact, actually, um, to be completely honest, or or some more movies chronicling the Hundred Years' War. Uh, the ba- the Battle of the Battle of Agincourt is uh, been completely untouched, really, other than by documentaries. I mean, it's quite it's quite a significant battle in historical terms because it's sort of the day that chivalry died. Yeah. Um, I mean, the the English army effectively executed a number of French knights that were captured behind enemy lines. Uh, I mean, uh, I mean, as you know, the the English were greatly outnumbered against the French, mm-hmm. um, and they had the French had the heavy cavalry, the heavily armoured like foot soldiers, the knights. Uh, they're defending in their own land, and the English army basically was full of you know light armoured foot soldiers that had the mobility to move around and archers. 
Yeah, yeah, no, but I think it's uh, isn't it covered in Henry V with uh, with uh, Kenneth Branagh? I haven't seen that film to be completely honest. But you've uh, seen the speech, like uh, I think on YouTube, where he's like saying, "We few, we happy few, we band of brothers," and all yes, of that. Stuff. Yes, yeah, yes, yes, yes. So that's that's the bit from the movie. That's actually before the Battle of Agincourt. I haven't seen it myself. I've just seen that scene. Uh, maybe that could be a film I could review one day. Oh but, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I mean, the numbers that they give for the battle to put it into perspective, like the, the estimates, the modern estimates were that the French had about thirty six thousand troops, well between twelve thousand and thirty six thousand, and the English army estimated the strength between six thousand and nine thousand. So if you just think about that in sheer terms, if we had, uh, you know, the, the the French were said to be outnumbering the English six to one, uh, and the English army managed to win, so it was about five five six of the English army was longbow archers. And the rest was basically dismounted knights and knights and men at arms. Yeah, and the French were said to have about ten thousand knights and men at arms, um, and about one over a thousand over a thousand mounted units as well. And yet the British managed to win just because of the conditions on the day and the terrain. And there was a number of um, a number of French prisoners were captured, about fifteen hundred, and they were murdered behind enemy lines because the French were basically looking to make an advance on the last day of the battle. And there was effect, There was almost there was about half the number of French soldiers were captured as uh, as English troops that were left that weren't wounded or injured. And basically, the king had no choice but to order the execution of um, of all the prisoners. But what I quite like about it is like how uh, he was able to g- uh, get so many good archers. Like he kind of, wasn't it like a mandatory law that everyone had to practice archery like every Sunday or something after church or something. Yeah, I mean, I think I believe a lot of the archer regiments came from Wales. Uh, give credit to the Welsh there. Uh, it's yeah. not just not just an not just a, an English army, although it was at the time it was referred to as England rather than the United Kingdom. But a lot of the uh, the regiments were Welsh archers uh, because they were they were like some of the best. That's basically where some of the best archers in in England came from at the time. Yeah, um, and they continue the to be. Now. Yeah, they continue to be the best archers until the Mongols came mm. and they uh, revolutionized how bows were made. But uh, yeah, longbow was like the snipers of the medieval times. The snipers, there we go. Yeah, the way it sort of changed everything in the battlefield. But uh, yeah, the death, the death of chivalry. So I think that's quite a chivalry's overrated anyway. You know, <laughs> as, <laughs> as, as that's a really English thing to say because like, we won. So. Yeah, victory is all that matters. Mm. That's all that matters. Back on to um, the 300 uh, and Spartans. Just just segueing across from that. Are you looking forward to seeing the Warcraft movie? I um, I mean, I'm curious to see it because I've never got into the uh, MMORPGs because I'm a sucker for uh, single player content. Like story is what sucks me in like, mm. uh, rather than um, gameplay. But I know that you're a massive, massive World of Warcraft fan, so and you've been, so I'm imagining you're pretty excited about it. Yeah, I, I am absolutely. I mean, like the what basically moving up. The reason why I said with Segway across in the 300, it's because the culture of the orcs in the film or the orcs in the game is effectively loosely based on Spartan society and Spartan culture. Like they're very much like a warrior people, um, and you know they, they don't really have citizens and civilians basically amongst the orcs they are they are all soldiers it's uh, they say you know loktar ogar which basically means victory or death um you know they're all about no retreat no surrender fight to the last man fight to the death so very much based on sort of the spartan culture and spartan way of life um i think you'll you'll appreciate the film um they've used they've gone back to effectively the first war in the game which is when the orcs first invade um, Azeroth, which is the the human homeworld, it's like an alien civilization effectively invading this planet, um, and the humans fight for survival against the orcs. So not too not too Lord of the Ringsy, <laughs> not too well. I saw the trailer. The guy's like jumping on a griffin or something, flying around. In fact, that actor actually uh, plays Ragnar Lothbrok in uh, Vikings. So I think that's what piqued my interest. I'm like, oh, oh okay. yeah, hacks. You, I mean, you can't mount up on the move in World of Warcraft, so that, that guy's, you know, clearly hacking in the film. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I know. I'm really hyped for that. I'm, I'm really hoping that they actually don't mess up um, another film based on comic books, and they'll be mad to mess this up because you know the Warcraft franchise has been going on for close to 20 years now. Comic uh, you mean movie you mean video games. The video games since yeah, yeah. the uh I mean I say Warcraft franchise because it was originally the RTS. 
Right. It wasn't World of Warcraft. World of Warcraft wasn't the first game. Yeah. Uh, Warcraft 1 came out in um, 1994. Okay. Or- Orcs and Humans. So there's all this established lore and all these established games going back 20 years' time that the movie franchise could easily go on for 10, 15 years. I'd be very interested in seeing a video game movie that doesn't suck. Like, that's that's all I want. I pray for it. I, I... Are you telling me you didn't love Street Fighter? Uh, <laughs> as much as I love Mortal Kombat, I'll say uh, that. Mortal Kombat was great. What are you talking about? Yeah, I know that you had it on DVD. and uh, <laughs> But you also had Mortal Kombat 2 as well. So, I don't know. I can't look down on you <laughs> for that. They were fun films, man. Street Street Fighter was great. I mean, you know, who doesn't love a bit of Jean-Claude Van Damme and Kylie Minogue? Yeah, well, to me, that was just a Jean-Claude Van Damme movie. It had nothing to do with Street Fighter whatsoever. Well, it also also had, if people may not know this, Ming-Na Wen from uh, from uh, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Um, she is in the Street Fighter film. If you guys go back and check that out, she plays Chun-Li. All right. Uh, well, have you got any other questions, Tyler? Uh, no, I think that's uh, oh, pretty right. much covered it, actually, for, uh, for the fan questions. Yeah, I actually, no, I've got some uh, additional questions I just wrote down from the the comment section. Okay. Uh, one. So this is from uh, Pimped Out Horseradish. So he says, uh, do I plan on any more loosely inspired by history fantasy world videos like I did with Game of Thrones? I don't know. <laughs> uh, well, I guess like Tyler was saying, I could do World of Warcraft. That's always an option. But I think Tyler would have to be my uh, leading expert in the subject since he's been playing the games from day one, from the sound of things. I'm a bit of a lore nerd when it comes to World of Warcraft, so I'd uh, more than happily join you on that. All right, that's, that sounds like a good idea. When is it coming out, by the way? Uh, June. Uh, June, okay. Wasn't it supposed to come out sooner? It was supposed to come out in December um, originally, but what other big film franchise is uh, releasing... Uh, the f- follow up in uh, in December. Mm. Can you tell me? Yeah, stop your head. Yeah, yeah. Star Wars. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, okay. So World of Warcraft, the Warcraft movie didn't want to go up against Star Wars at the box office, uh, and they said that one of the reasons they gave is historically or generally films generally do better at the box office uh, in the summer than they do in December. That was the reason they gave. They wouldn't say they don't want to go up against Star Wars, but, uh, you know, we, we, it's pretty obvious. It's kind of That's bullshit, what. yeah. I mean, yeah. like, uh, look at Avatar. You know, that did pretty well, considering it came out in December, so... Yeah. yeah. Um, oh, but so- uh, on that point, though, the theory really is that they pushed it back to coincide with the release of the new expansion for World of Warcraft, Legion. Um, I mean, from a business standpoint, that also makes sense, because like Star Wars are doing, they released, they've just released Battlefront, um which is made by the same people that make Battlefield. Yeah. Um, that's just been released. There's a new expansion, I believe, for the MMO, the Star Wars MMO, Knights of the Old Republic, coming out in December. So that maximizes hype. Obviously, if the film comes out, people are going to think, oh my god, that was great. I wish I could run around with a lightsaber. They'll check out Battlefront. They'll check out, you know, Knights of the Old Republic um, or the Old Republic. Uh, and they, you know, they may be increasing buy rates in the game. Same with Warcraft. Uh, the new World of Warcraft expansion is due to come out. They said September at the latest last year, but uh, next year, sorry. But I'd be extremely surprised if it doesn't come out in June, within a week, within two weeks either side of the film, just to maximise hype and bring some of the returning players, bring some players back to the player base, or uh, bring new players into the world. Okay, all right. So that's that's one. Um, I had one cheeky idea of maybe doing a video. I mean, like. I, I kind of thought maybe not to do it, like I couldn't justify it, but then I'm thinking, hey, fuck it, if, if I did Game of Thrones, then really I could just do anything, as long as it's sort of relevant to history. Uh, mm-hmm. I would love to do something about, like, Stargate. I have no idea why, I just, that's my favourite sci-fi TV show of all time, and uh, the, I think the reason I got into it in the first place is because I loved uh, uh, Egyptian history, and uh, ancient Egyptian history, and uh, ancient Egyptian mythology, and it kind of, like, walked a fine line, that show, between being uh, set in the past historically, and also having aliens, that kind of stuff in it, um, so, I don't know, maybe, like, I'll save that for, like, uh, like, like I did with Game of Thrones, so... I know someone said about doing something about Star Wars, but I don't know if people would be interested in knowing like the historical inspirations behind Star Wars. Maybe that might be a thing, but I don't know. Uh, Stargate would be something I would really want to get into. Like actually talking about the um, the Egyptian gods that uh, the Gua'uld are based on and that kind of stuff. So uh, yeah. So you do you 
on this point of Stargate, do you prefer Stargate to Stargate Atlantis? I no, no I have to say like I uh, I'm a die hard fan for SG1. I love Stargate Atlantis. I was really bummed out when season 5 um ended uh just to make up the the crappy Stargate Universe TV show. I mean like Stargate Universe was all right. I watched it. I, I yeah, I it, it was okay, Tyler. I mean like I'm a, I'm a die hard fan but even I thought it was all right. It, but it was uh, nah. it, no way could it uh, it justify though them ending um, Atlantis prematurely is all I could say <laughs> but uh, I think I'd have to say SG-1 is my favourite simply because come on you got like O'Neill and Teal being hilarious and Daniel Jackson and all of that like they're, they're really funny characters um, uh, Teal is a very good character I prefer him to Ronan you prefer, uh, do you see that episode where Ronan and uh, Teal they go head to head yeah they fight I just yeah. thought that was so funny that I just thought Teal's haircut was ridiculous in it but uh yeah, there was nothing cooler than seeing Teal having a machine gun blasting through Wraith. I thought that was pretty, pretty epic. Well, Ronan uh, saves Teal in the episode, doesn't he? Teal's on the verge of dying, if I remember correctly. And yeah, yeah, towards, it's true. Towards the end. Well, yeah. well Teal is getting old in his age. He's like 150 years old or something. Like uh, it's still, a, still a spring chicken for Gould. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I didn't know you were a Stargate fan as well. Yeah, I was a big fan of Stargate quite a few. I mean, it's been many years since I've watched Stargate. I mean, when when did the first one go off the air, SG-1? This, uh... 1997, I think it was. And it went off the air in 2007. Does that sound about right to you? It was about then, 2006, 2007? Um, no, I think, well, uh, SG-1. Yeah. Uh, yeah, quite possibly. I, I need to double check that, but uh, I think it was something around that time. I know that they finished uh, SGU 2011, I think. That was the last of the Stargate stuff when uh, uh, MGM was close to bankruptcy and all of that. But they really should bring that back on uh, on Netflix, I think. Like, I, I would certainly be watching it. You know, I, do, I prefer it more than this stupid idea of like them uh, rebooting the, um, the 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 original movie. Are they planning on doing that? Are they? Yeah, Roland Emmerich is uh, planning to make a trilogy to the uh, to the first movie that he made and scrapping all the lore that was built up by the TV shows. Oh, God. Yeah. Why? I Why? I... Yeah. Because, like, one uh, season of Atlantis made more money than uh, the in- than the movie. Mm. So, yeah, it's, it's ridiculous. Yeah, I, I don't like it when uh, when people feel the need to unnecessarily reboot the franchise. Uh, what was the... So, okay, let's see any other questions. Um, am I planning to... <laughs> Okay, maybe I'll read this one. Uh, uh, pimped out horseradish asked, like, am I planning on putting up a video of me singing sea shanties whilst drunk? <laughs> we, we could do that. We could do that one night, yeah. Yeah, yeah. All right. That sounds like a good idea. So uh, it could be a big reveal of what I actually look like, I, although I doubt that people will want to see what I really look like. I couldn't care less. You look very much like your cartoon avatar. Yeah, people think I look like Stephen Merchant in the thing. Uh, I, I could see uh, I could see you could be relatives, yeah. Yeah, they're, they're, seriously, though, some people think I'm copying off of uh, Ricky Gervais's um, cartoon podcast thing from back in the day. And uh, I was just like, might as well have Tyler saying, like, no, guys, he, he really, really, really looks like that. <laughs> yeah, you really do look a bit like Stephen Merchant. <laughs> just not same, as tall. Same, same glasses, similar sort of hairstyle, yeah. yeah. Uh, although you don't have the sort of rugged facial hair. I don't think you can even grow facial hair, can you? No, I'm 28 years old and I still can't grow facial hair. Yeah, so there you go, guys. He, he can't grow st- uh, facial hair like Stephen Merchant. But other than that, he's basically his cousin. Yeah, <laughs> practically. Uh, let's see, is there any other things? Uh, uh, no, that's pretty much about it. Oh, wow, we sort of covered everything. Uh, all right. Well, we've done we've done an hour and eight minutes. We, uh, we can wrap this puppy up, if you like. We'll wrap it up. All right. Well, thank you very much, Tyler, for coming onto the show. Uh, it's a pleasure, mate, any time. You know, I'm always happy to help out. Yes, and uh, for any of you listeners out there, please uh, send in your uh, questions. Actually, don't send them in. Write them down in the comments section below, and I'll like uh, copy and paste them, and I'll read them out into the to the next podcast. In the comments section below. All right, thanks very much, everybody. Thank you.